Are you ready for the fastest plug you've ever seen? Because before we get into today's video, I'd just like to let you know that there are roughly 100 signature tees left of the limited edition merch drop, which will be ending April 17th. So if you'd like to go ahead and check out danielbgreen.com, you can go ahead and get your goblin swag today. All right, fine! I'll go ahead and do another top 10 list. I do one of these roughly every year to possibly bring a new series to your attention, but also just give an update for my audience and how my taste has changed and grown over the last 300 365 days, and which new series or books in that time have jumped up into all-time favorite status. I actually wasn't planning on doing one this year, but I've been asked several times to do so, and so I will be putting out a new list this year, but please don't expect it to be entirely different from last year's list, because I, yes, have changed in taste, but I'm not trying to deliver something that's just wildly different for the sake of being wildly different and having new books to talk about. I don't want to get in the habit of lying for content. That is to say there are no new favorites or fallen series this year, that certainly is the case. So without any further ado, let us go ahead and jump into the dishonorable mentions. This on you? This on you, cow? Now, please know that these are not actually like so bad or the worst thing I read in the last 365 days, but instead series that were really high up on my list at some point that are probably just going to be notably absent from this year's list. The first of which is going to be a series I have commented on for quite a while of just aggressively fading from memory and aside from some stupendous characters, just narratively not making much of an impression on me in the world building sense either. I am just kind of feeling rather eh on this world as a whole, and that is unfortunately going to be The Witcher. Despite some of the oddest moments in the series as a whole definitely being solidified in my brain forever, there are choices here creatively that really do feel bold and ambitious from the author and play out quite well. Maybe this is just because I'm consuming so many different fantastic stories of all kinds of different flavor profiles that Witcher is starting to feel more and more just fine to me, but yes, something that used to place in my top five, I believe, is now something that I wouldn't even count among my favorites. That isn't to say there is nothing to enjoy here. It was high up on my list at one point, and as I said, the characters within the Witcher series are iconic. I love that they are so steeped in the tradition of fantasy itself, yet have a substantial update to many of the tropes if you're a massive fantasy fan you might have come overly accustomed to to this point. Witcher does stand out from the crowd, and it is a series I would recommend to maybe more people than almost any other series on this list. I also think Witcher as a whole, and commendably to the author, treats its audience very respectfully in terms of believing they can keep up with what is happening in the page, and pacing itself out in a way that is super consumable, especially if you enjoy the shorter story format that often is in the series as a whole. But is it still one of my all-time favorites? Sadly not. And then in the biggest drop so far for me, we are going to have the Dresden Files. This was a series at one point I genuinely felt could have had a shot at being a forever top two fantasy series of all time. It really felt like Jim Butcher, the author behind it, was growing Dresden Files in the middle of the series in a way that could profoundly recontextualize what the Dresden world had the potential to be. And while I do still think that Dresden Files as a whole is a really great examination of an author improving many elements of their craft overall, and Jim Butcher certainly can still deliver thrills with this character. My own emotional investment in the story of Dresden has just taken some haymakers recently with what these last few stories we have gotten from Mr. Butcher have done for the character. Peace Talks and Battlegrounds. Hype Up was incredible, but what we ended up getting to me felt underdeveloped, and while it certainly was gargantuan, the aftermath of what has occurred really hasn't been addressed in a way that I'm a big fan of. I know we've only gotten one smaller Dresden story in the wake of this, but it was the delivery of the events themselves that just leave me feeling extremely underwhelmed, and I find myself really wanting to go back to that comfy, cozier setting Dresden I felt was so powerful in. This Sherlock Holmesian wizard was just fabulous. But then we did actually get a story like that from Butcher that felt like a phenomenal opportunity to bring in those ramifications from those larger stakes into a smaller story for Dresden and take time to really process them as a character and for the reader to process the events through Dresden. While the law tried to do that, the end result just felt very underwhelming to me, as well as seeing many of the early elements for heavy criticism Dresden had as a series coming back into 
the law, despite I feel like we as readers and a story had just grown beyond those issues. The end result is that unfortunately Dresden Files is being dragged down by just entries into the later part of the series I am not enjoying. But we can move past that bummer note and right on into the honorable mentions. These are stories that I can't push into my top 11. I couldn't even get it down to 10, it's top 11, but absolutely are still favorites of mine I can geek out about any day. And the first of which is one I think some people might find surprising to be here, and that is going to be the Dune series. Now, I have only read God Emperor of Dune, Children of Dune, Dune Messiah, and of course, Dune, and I'm a bit hesitant to go further because I've been warned. What Frank Herbert grew Dune into after the first book is something I seriously love. Now, as I controversially have said repeatedly, I'm actually not that big a fan of the first Dune book. I think it is good. It's just the wild angles Frank Herbert went with in the sequels that for me as a reader who enjoys the weird really started to appreciate how poignant Dune is overall thematically and narratively. Yes, because of my enjoyment of the sequels, I think I do appreciate the first Dune book more, but I am willing to throw down with any Dune fan any day that the sequels are what make the series iconic and special. And also it recontextualized so much of where I thought this specific genre of sci-fi, the gargantuan space epic, uh, came from in terms of influence. I knew Dune was a big deal, but I also do believe its sequels are just as influential as the first book as well in certain sectors of science fiction and fantasy. Frank Herbert also really improves his prose in my opinion, and the full message and concept behind these families and the themes of the series really only become clear in my opinion once you get to books two, three, and four. There is genius writing here, and I love it. But it is still just an honorable mention. And these next two I have talked about ad nauseum, so I'm going to go ahead and just bullet on through them. But the next honorable mentions are going to be the Far Seer trilogy and, of course, the Dark Tower. These have fluctuated in my favorites for years now. I think Dark Tower's ending is actually brilliant, and I will fight anyone about that any day. I can't get to it now because spoilers, but on anyone who thinks it's not genius. And Robin Hobb's work with Fitz is possibly one of the best just go to, oh my God, look at it and study it examples of character work I have ever seen. Uh, she is able to grow a very flawed, arguably stupid character for book after book in a way that is so enticing to follow. And if you are a writer who wants to research a character that is immensely flawed, but still so likable and agreeable while being infinitely frustrating, you know, the really special type of character you end up talking about with people for hours, Fitz is a fantastic place to start. I really want to have Robin Hobb on the channel for an interview, but she intimidates me as a writer. Like, I, I feel like she's too smart for me to interview. I'm like, I don't even know what I'd ask her. You're so good at what you do. Another honorable mention is going to be the Cosmere. Yes, I still do really love the Cosmere. It's just not in my personal top 10. Do I enjoy it so goddamn much? But there are some entries I'm not that big a fan of. Other entries, like Trust of the Emerald Sea, I think are sensational. And I actually have, weirdly, the opinion that if Brandon keeps putting out quality on the level he has recently, it could climb back into the top 10. These things ebb and flow, or you could say, undulate. And we have another honorable mention of the Bloodsworn Saga from John Gwynn. Two books in, and I am anticipating a third like no one else's business. I plan on doing a lore deep dive on the series soon, so I'm going to keep this brief, but John Gwynn is someone who is just coming out and consistently hitting bigger and harder as an author, and I am so excited as a fan to continue to see what they can deliver. Next up is another one I have talked about quite a bit, so I'm just going to say Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the best time I have ever had when reading a science fiction book and has more than any other book in the history of writing made me laugh out loud. Even in funny books, I don't often laugh out loud. I laugh out loud with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And then the last honorable mention is going to be a new addition to the favorites rankings, and that is going to be Kindred by Octavia Butler. More than any other author I discovered last year, Octavia Butler is who I am most excited to read more from. Kindred is a heart-wrenching story that is going to make you question so many different 
angles to your own belief systems when it comes to how someone is able to survive in a horrendous situation. But the story of Kindred is a black woman being sent back in time to the antebellum South and trying to survive in a tale that refuses to allow you to forget that every single character you are witnessing is a human being with complex motivations and deep flaws, but because of that is able to deliver a evil onto the page that feels so sickeningly real that this is a book I had to close or I guess stop the audio because I did the audiobook of this several different times just to fully process the emotions and try and think through the actions of the character I was following the story along with because you also are going to end up questioning and maybe not even liking some of the protagonists of this story. Mistakes are made, people are manipulated, and Octavia Butler is one of the best sci-fi writers I have ever encountered. But first I'd like to give a big thank you to today's sponsor, Warframe. Many of you might already know Warframe as it's one of the top played games on Steam and has been for over eight years with regular content added through updates. But if you're not familiar, you basically get to play as a space ninja and embark on action-packed quests across the galaxy, either solo or with friends. That's right, it's free to play online cooperative game with over 70 million players. Now their newest update, the Duviri Paradox, transforms the game with a brand new rogue light time looping massive open world adventure that players on all platforms can experience for free. When you jump into the Duviri Paradox, the Drifter will set off on a gritty sci-fi adventure to escape an enormous open world that transforms based on the mood of its ruler. The Child King, Dominus Thrax. The action is fast paced and a ton of fun. And if you sign up now and download Warframe with my link below while using my promo code, you'll be able to claim a free bundle of items that are perfect for new players to get started in Warframe, including the Bratton Assault Rifle and a three day affinity and credit booster. This is only for a limited time though, so click the link below and join the many others checking out Warframe's most recent update the Duviri Paradox. But this brings us to the top 11 because I have a lot to say here <laughs> and I couldn't get it down to just 10. I know that's kind of annoying. I'm still going to title it top 10 because algorithm. But we have a few at the beginning here that I can go ahead and just knock out of the way because I have already talked about them in previous lists. And if you'd like to see more in deep thoughts, you just have to watch my previous year's list and get even more great recommendations of books I love. But at number 11, we have Red Rising by Pierce Brown, a series I am kind of surprised myself to see so high and actually make the top 11, but I couldn't not include it due to its underdog rise within the rankings of books for me personally. I straight up didn't really like the first Red Rising book. I thought it felt like it was trying to be ambitious, while the end result was so simplistic. The only thing that really kept me interested to coming back was the characters. Each and every single entry in the Red Rising series has been a step up from the one before it, and it feels like Pierce Brown is still, with his most recent entry in the series, just now getting to the greatest heights Red Rising can rise to. It also feels like he's managing to evolve the core concepts that established this story into greater ideas that maybe he is only picking up now that he's this many books in, but the writing is solid enough that these new thematic elements that certainly weren't necessarily there in the first book are never jarring to have introduced and always feel fully realized for the context of the greater narrative. And maybe most of all, Red Rising is just cool. The aesthetics of this universe and the terms like Iron Rain and the execution and prose of the action within the page are, oh my god, where Pierce Brown's biggest strength as an author comes in, in my opinion. There are people out there who, with the pen, are able to paint pictures of imagery that will stay in your mind for weeks, and Pierce Brown has an affinity for it. This is the number one thing on this list that sits at the how has it not been picked up for adaptation yet. It is ripe to be adapted, structured fantastically to be put into a screenplay, and I don't know, Hollywood's dropped the ball. Red Rising with a great director behind it or a solid showrunner is something I would get my ass 
in a seat for in a heartbeat. At number 10, we have One Piece, and I think there's gonna be some people surprised to see this so low on the list, and no, it's not because I have just not been reading it, I've been still behind, but slowly catching up with the series, and I kinda miss a few years ago. I don't know, don't hate me for it, but I still am enjoying what's happening. Don't get me wrong, it is still in my top 10. I like how big and how much growth we are seeing at for the series as a whole. The Straw Hats have never felt more realized and the villains have never been more dragony. But for me personally, one of the biggest appeals for One Piece was just feeling like it was the ultimate, we are never going to be the guys on top, we're always going up against titans, but we'll find a way to win type series, type story. And it feels like to me, we've moved beyond that. And now the characters are the major players, which has its own appeal as a fan. It kind of feels just like, oh my God, it's so cool and awesome. But I find myself looking back to arcs like Water 7 that just felt like they had a bit more heart and a bit more intimacy with me as a reader and the crew who I felt like such a part of. There's also been a lack of development for a couple key straw hats that has really left me wanting, especially because they are my favorite straw hats. And so while I am still eager to catch up and continue reviewing One Piece with you all and getting another review sooner rather than later in the works here on the channel, this is suffering from a much smaller case of what brought Dresden down. Much smaller. I mean, dear God, it's still in my top 10. At number nine, we have some pure brain candy dopamine. Something that is just sweet and delightful, not the deepest, but packs a surprising punch. And that is going to be the Bobbyverse. This might be the most controversial thing for me to have in my top 10. I do not care. In some ways, it's dumb nerd schlock, and in those ways, I love it. The idea of having my consciousness put in some form of AI and blasted into space has been something that every, I feel like, major space nerd has wondered about. Being able to explore the stars indefinitely, whether that's through the Starship Enterprise or, you know, the Millennium Falcon, we all have dreams of that. Bobbyverse has realized that, in such a special way. Yes, it is a story about having your consciousness shot off into the stars and exploring for all time. I personally don't find this to be a spoiler because it is literally in the name of the series, Bob Verse, but then your consciousness gets to multiply and you get to work with yourself, pack in a ton of pop culture references and genuinely funny written dialogue, but also high stakes evolution of what could happen with humanity in some dire situations as we try to grow into the galactic race we hope to be one day. And finally, fantastic internal conflict made literally external for us. And at the end of the day, it's just something that seems like it was tailor made for me to enjoy. I find it to be so charming, so consumable, and one of the comfiest, coziest reads of all time. At number eight, we have a series I have talked about quite a bit here on the channel, and I don't feel the need to get too much into here, but I'm going to go ahead and just say it is Malazan, the literal opposite of Bobverse. I think if you tried to say what are the two polar opposites of what you could do with science fiction and fantasy, Bobverse and Malazan would be on the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Steven Erickson might just be the smartest man to ever write a fantasy epic, and it shows in Malazan. It's not my favorite of all time, but it's the one I have the hardest time criticizing aside from just the amount of legwork you have to do as a reader to really get into it at the beginning. But once you are caught up in the tide, Malazan brings you into an ocean of ideas, world building, and characters that nothing else in science fiction and fantasy has ever felt like to me or nothing else has ever been able to scratch that itch for me. Malazan is just built different. And at number seven, we have another thing that hits the palette quite a bit different, but for science fiction, and that would be Hyperion. Take a classic tale structure, put it in a sci-fi setting, think through your ideas, and make it a wider narrative with a bunch of smaller narratives set up throughout it, and you've essentially made the perfect story for me to just swallow on down. Hyperion is the most beautifully written thing on this list. Each entry is varying degrees of extremely solid. This is actually one of the few sci-fi 
series and in my opinion just doesn't have a weak entry or even just a good one they're all great and i am planning on making more hyperion videos in the near future so i won't say too much more beyond just if you want to read along with me or at least be read by the time i'm putting out that content there is no better time to read hyperion than right now at number six we have Murderbot. Falling in kind of once again to a comfy, cozy read, but adding in a few too many cords of tension and stripping it back to being a bit more dry world with a corporate dystopian feel to it. And Murderbot is a story that successfully feels like it's just telling the story of you in a disturbing but very seen way. Martha Wells has this ability to capture anxiety, to capture depression, and put it in her murder bot so clearly that it does just feel like the story is describing social awkwardness or stress you've felt in the day-to-day -day life. It's the story of that pain you go through, but placed into a murder machine who then has to figure out some mysteries and why, why wouldn't you want to read that? At least to my imagination, the Murderbot world reminds me so much of the one from Alien. It is corporate, there is this bureaucracy feeling to so much, but then through all of that, you're able to find this heart and this thriving emotional existence within these artificial intelligences that interact with humans and each other and learn in ways that are just so intriguing. Murderbot accidentally is so wise and comforting to the minds around it. And in terms of representation, it's really hard to say to someone who hasn't read the books, but this is one of the best mental health series ever put to the page, in my opinion, which is, you know, ever is going to be a word you start hearing a lot when I get into my top 10. And then at number five, we have, oh, you knew it was going to be high. Berserk. The underdogs of underdogs for this list, I started hating Berserk, but now I find it to be one of the most enticing epic fantasy stories ever told. Guts the Struggler is a man who has grown and become so much more wholesome for me than I ever thought he could, and his antagonist Griffith's glory is so repugnant, definitely more flawed than many of the series I am putting it higher than on this list. Berserk somehow manages to even use some of those flaws that might repulse you at the beginning to then turn around and deliver even more catharsis for these high emotional beats that are so rare, but once you're able to locate one in a smile or a brief connection made between two people, the darkness of this world is its source of beauty, which is thematically reflected in the main antagonist and is somehow maybe twisted in a dark way for the protagonist. And concepts like that of having just total backwards reflection of the development of what a protagonist and antagonist can be and positioning of perspective with the narrative, there is a genius to this manga that has awoken me even more than One Piece already did to the benefits of this medium. And that is before even talking about Mura's art as it evolves through the series transcends just being great manga art and instead just becomes some of the most impressive depictions of creature design or landscapes or emotions on faces I have ever seen. Eldritch Lovecraftian type horrors to just a beast in the shadows, Mura is able to just paint a depth and senses of scale like I have never seen before. Yes, the deluxe editions are expensive, but purely because you get the art a little bit bigger that way, I think they're worth the investment. There are so many people who either are fans and misinterpret the beauty of Berserk or aren't and miss out it entirely because they don't get deep enough. But there is no series I want to just grab people to tell them to read further, read more, more than Berserk. And then number four. The Greenbone Saga, which is tied with number three, the First Law series. I have talked about both these series at extreme depth, so I won't waste any more of your time. Feel free to go to previous year's lists or go ahead and just go to the reviews of those books I have here on the channel. But these two have strangely sat in contention for me for best ongoing modern fantasy series. But that leads us to number two. And I know what you're already asking. Did Discworld displace the Wheel of Time? No, 
Number two is Discworld, and I'm going to be doing lore deep dives on Discworld soon as well, so keep your eye out for that. And number one is The Wheel of Time. No, the show didn't drag it down below number one. It will forever be the most important series I have ever read, and in my opinion, America's greatest fantasy epic. And... Yeah, in my opinion, the world's greatest fantasy epic. But Daniel! Where's the Lord of the Rings? Well, this is purely enjoyment, not respect. And I respect the Lord of the Rings maybe more than any other fantasy series in the world. But in terms of sitting down for personal enjoyment, it's not where my taste is right now. So it's not a dishonorable mention because I still respect the absolute shit out of it. But if we're doing pure enjoyment, it's not in my top 10. But it could be an honorable mention. Here, well, well in hindsight, here I'm going to take... The Lord of the Rings. This is me taking all of it. Here's here's my honorable mentions. I'm just going to put the, the Lord of the Rings right in there. And now you can say it was technically mentioned. Wonderful! But this has just been my updated 2023 top 10 sci-fi fantasy series list. I'm sure I have forgotten some I really wish I had included. But for now, I'm just going to ask you to leave me your top 10 list in the comments down below. That is often where I do mine for potential things to add to my TBR. But anyway, everyone, like and subscribe if you have not already. And hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.